I want to go back to the idea of a unit speed curve because that turns out to be really useful um, when you do a lot of geometry on curves. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how you could create that if you don't have it. And it can get a little hairy, but I'll, I'll show you an example. So our favorite example of a unit speed curve that's not just like going along a straight line or something is the unit circle parameterized in the usual way, cosine t sine t. Um, but I want to just think about a general curve going from t equals a to t equals b. And I want to bring in something that's really important. And that's not just the length of the curve as a number, but what's called s of t. And we'll call that arc length so far. Now, this is a function that starts at the start of the curve, let's say at t equals a and just records as you go along the curve how far you've gone. So it's a function of t, and so I'm going to just put the s values here. So s equals 0 is going to be here at the start of the curve. And then maybe um, here is going to be s equals 1. And it's going to be equal length to get to s equals 2, and equal length maybe right here to get to s equals 3, etc. Okay. Now, in general, this could, the curve could be going faster or slower, so it could be very different amounts of time to get from z s equals 0 to s equals 1 versus s equals 1 to s equals 2. But let's assume it's a unit speed curve, and therefore this guy is going to be t equals a plus 1. And this guy is going to be t equals a plus 2, and this guy is going to be t equals a plus 3. Because unit speed, after all, means one way to talk about the speed is ds dt equals 1. And what's the solution to that? s is just going to be the only thing with derivative 1 is just t plus a constant. And that constant is pretty clear from here. It's just going to be t plus a. Okay. So you can think about it sort of algebraically, differential equation, incredibly simple differential equation, or just geometrically that if he's going at unit speed to go one unit of distance, it's going to be one unit of time. Okay, So there, there's a very, very simple relationship between the time values and the position values. And in fact, um, it's almost never hard, or not almost never a bad idea, to redefine t just with a shift. OK. And if we just shift t and we re re redefine it and say, you know what, it'd be really convenient. We could just change our formulas a little bit. It's not going to be that hard. And we re redefine t. And everywhere we see a t, we kind of subtract a. That means this is going to turn into 0. This will turn into 1. This will turn into 2. OK. And then you'll just have s equal to t. And that's going to be a very, very simple thing. Okay, and when we say that when we have s equals t, or usually we often even allow this s equals t plus a thing, just a shift, because it's not a big deal, then we say that the curve is parameterized by arc length. Because what we can do is we can actually throw away t and use s as the parameter itself. Instead of saying, I let the clock run a certain amount of time, and then you tell me where the, where the particle is, I say, I'm going to let the, the, the object walk or run or fly or whatever a certain amount of distance, and then you can tell me where it is. So this is going to be something where s is the variable um, instead of t. And that's great, because s has a far more geometric meaning. It's something that's really a, an artifact of the curve. It's something that's really connected to the curve. It's not just related to how the particle is traversing the curve. Okay, so unit speed basically is equivalent to parameterized by arc length using this function s as the parameter. Um, so, for example, some simple examples. Of course, cosine t sine t. So I'm going to show you examples of where it happens and where it and where it doesn't happen. What the contrast is. So one is cosine t sine t. So here, let me make this bigger. OK, so we start here. t equals 0. That's also, let's say, where we start measuring a length. s equals 0. Here, this is t equals pi over 2 to get 0, 1. And it's also, of course, if this is the unit circle, the arc length of quarter circle, 
so far is s equals pi over 2. And over here, to get cosine t sine t to be minus 1, 0, that's t equals pi, but of course it's also s equals pi. This isn't surprising because we know that the speed here was equal to 1, and so s is just t plus a constant, and because we started at t equals 0, it's just s equals t. So we could equally well say that this is r of s is cosine s sine s, and completely um, erase the arbitrary t that's not geometric, and so that replace it with this with a geometrically meaningful quantity. So this is very nice because we happen to have a unit speed curve to start with. The parameter we were given, t, which often has nothing to do directly with the geometry, was identical to s, which is geometrically meaningful. So for a contrast, we could look at something that's very similar but not unit speed, and that's going to be r equals cosine 2t sine 2t. So that's still going around exactly the same curve. Cosine squared plus sine squared is still 1. It even starts in the same location, but it's not going to get to the same place at the same time as it did before. Here, to get up here, I actually put in t equals pi over 4, because then I double it, I get cosine pi over 2 sine pi over 2. Here, it gets to here at t equals pi over 2, etc. Okay. So this is, but this is still s equals pi over 2 up here. And this is still s equals pi, because those are geometric. Those are really length measurements. That hasn't changed. So let's calculate the velocity and make sure that that's com consistent with what we're seeing there. OK, that's minus 2 sine 2t, two, 2 cosine 2t. Two, so the magnitude of that, just factor out the 2. You can always factor out the 2, factor out a constant factor. And then we just get sine squared 2t plus cosine squared 2t. It doesn't matter that it's a 2t. It's still sine squared plus cosine squared of something. It's still 1, and so the magnitude is 2. So that's the speed. OK. So for every unit of time we go, we go twice as far as we'd expect. And that makes sense that in t equals pi over 4, we went t equal, uh, s equals pi over 2. OK. So for example, let's think about how that affects arc length. We had in the previous example, we would have had the length is just zero to integral 0 to 2 pi of speed dt. OK, it seems like maybe that should be s true still, right? It's just integral a, t equals a to t equals b of speed dt. You might want to pause and do this calculation yourself and see what's, what's weird about it. OK, well, the speed, of course, is just constant. We just calculated that. Integral of a constant from a to b is just that constant times b minus a, and you get 4 pi. That's certainly not the circumference of the, the unit circle. OK, and hopefully it's fairly clear what went wrong here um, based on this. Do I really need to go to 2 pi here? What happens if I go to 2 pi? Well, let's see. To get one time around the circle exactly, at double speed, I only have to let t go to pi. That's where I get s equals 2 pi. That would be the correct calculation. So I take that out, and that would be 2 pi. By leaving the 2 pi in there, that's really twice around the circle. And that's a tricky thing about um, periodic functions and, and closed curves that you traverse more than once. You have to make sure, if you want the length of the closed curve, make sure you're only going out around it exactly once. This is something we actually, it's a shadow of something we see in, in trig when we solve trig equations w when we have like twos in here. Um, they, can get, they can get tricky about we're double covering the circle. Okay, So that's something to, to be careful of. Um, so that's, that's an illustration. Even when the speed is constant, it brings in tricky stuff that we'd rather not have to worry about. That's one reason why the unit speed condition is so nice. Now, if the speed isn't constant, we'll see, especially when we get to curvature, that it makes the formulas far more complicated. Um, so that's going to be another benefit for having a unit speed when we get to curvature. So let me talk about, uh, let me show you an example of, suppose you had something that didn't start out with unit speed or even constant speed. So here's example three. E the t cosine t. I guess I'll, uh, I have been using round brackets, but let's use angle brackets, whatever. Okay. As I've said, it doesn't really matter too much for the for the position. For the velocity, really, you really should be using the angle brackets if you're using 
the notation of um, Stewart. If you're not, then it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's just go ahead and take the, actually, let's figure out what this curve looks like. Okay, real quick, if it was cosine t sine t, of course, it would be the circle. And so what we're basically getting is something where the radius is increasing exponentially, but you're also going around the circle. So it's an exponential spiral. It actually spirals out more aggressively than that because the exponential grows so fast, but it's the idea. Spiraling around counterclockwise um, and getting bigger exponentially as you go. If you take the derivative, a little bit of uh, product rule here, I'll just write it down because it's not a too hard product rule calculation. Get uh, still the e's and the cosines, but a little bit more complicated. Okay, so now let's take the magnitude of that. Again, we've got a common factor, so let's just take that out. And then we get something that looks like it could be a mess, but whenever we have square root of squares and stuff like that, we're hoping something's good. And I did contrive this to be at least reasonably nice. What I, the process I'm going to be doing here is another one of those things that's absolutely impossible if you don't, don't contrive it at least a little bit, or unless you're kind of lucky or there's something special about your physical situation. Oh, didn't quite fit. So I just squared those out, okay. And then the great thing is these cancel. And I get cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So I get a relatively simple formula, root 2e to the t. So what does that mean? Here's the next step. What we're going to do is we're going to try and actually reparameterize with respect to arc length. Okay. So the goal is to reparameterize. We've got a function of t. We've got a we can keep track of where you are if you tell me the time, but I'd love to know the relationship between the position and the distance so far function, the s function. So we've already got the, the crucial link, which is the rate of change of s with respect to t is root 2e to the t. So I can figure out s as a function of t, which you might think, wait a minute, that's still not, not good because we're not supposed to have things as a function of t. But in a minute, we'll figure out how to fix it. Well, a constant times e to the t, the antiderivative of that is just itself plus a constant. And let's go ahead and try to make sure that s equals 0 when t equals 0. We don't have to do it that way, but it's a, it's a reasonable choice. OK, so when t equals 0, this is going to be root 2. So this is going to have to be minus root 2 or I'm going to factor out the root 2. OK, so here's the next step. We don't really want s as a function of t. If we can get t as a function of s, though, we can plug it into here, and we can get r as a function of arc length so far. So the steps are calculate the speed, integrate to get position as a function of time, and then invert. It's a great use of inverse function thinking. Okay. Alrighty, so if s is root 2 e to the t minus 1, I'm going to save just that. I don't want to make this video too long, but we're getting close to the end. Okay. Then uh, t, let's then e to the t is uh, 1 plus s over root 2, and t is the ln of 1 plus s over root 2. Okay. And then all we do is we stick it back into our original formula which I probably shouldn't have erased, but that's okay. Now, the e to the t happens to be relatively simple. And then the rest of it gets a little complicated. It's cosine of ln of this linear function. And if this looks absurdly complicated, two comments. One is that probably means you've only had math classes and not like used math as like an engineer or a physicist or something because they get formulas like this show up all the time when you do it in real life. And then the second thing is yeah, it's more complicated than what we start with, started with, okay? Oh, this is of s, and that's the whole point. Okay, so this is now reparameterized with respect to arc length, and this is going to have unit speed, okay? And it might be underwhelming to say, ooh, this is a good answer. It's kind of complicated, and there's a real trade-off. If we want the least complicated formula, we want, would have stayed with t. But what we're going to see when we get to formulas involving curvature and things, especially if you go really far with this stuff, further than we usually go in this class, um, it's a really good thing to have unit speed. It has, makes all the other formulas much simpler. And it's often actually a reasonable trade-off to, to have this complexity to make all the other things simpler. Um, but I wanted to show you the steps of that, that you calculate dsdt, you integrate, you invert, and then you just plug back in. And oh yeah, it's complicated, but you're done. And it's got much, much better properties. Okay, that's a good place to stop this one.